In the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, the source of love and lover of souls. Amen. Since our celebration of Easter, we spent much of our time back in that upper room. Through John's gospel, we've been revisiting the final meal that Jesus shared with his friends in the long hours that followed the meal. Despite having taught them for three years about his identity and his calling, the disciples can't break free of their belief that, the, the, that his messiahship is tied to an earthly realm. Nothing in their experience, not even Jesus's miraculous signs, has prepared them to grasp the cosmic dimensions of Jesus's true nature. They're trying so hard to understand, but it's become a race against time. Now and then, after dinner, one of them has been bold enough to ask Jesus what many of them were likely thinking. In our lesson today, it's Philip, who tries to strike a bargain with Jesus. Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Now, if this were a sitcom back in my distant youth, this is the point where one of the boys would turn to the other and ask, what you talking about, Philip? Which is sort of the nature of Jesus's retort. Philip's all, just give us this one additional thing and it's all gonna be good. This only causes Jesus to lament that they still don't know him. And if just, as if just one more thing would do the trick. His disappointment, though, soon melts into compassion for his friends. These men, simultaneously his beloved friends and his followers, are desperately frightened. From their perspective, they left everything they had behind and invested all their energy in three years of discipleship. Now their teacher is, in their eyes, abandoning. Anxiety, depression, desperation, even fear for their own lives grips them. And just as he will two more times this evening, Jesus promises them that another advocate will be with them. So in John's gospel, from which all three years of our Pentecost readings come, the promise of the Holy Spirit is made in the context of an intimate pastoral encounter between Jesus and his friends. We sometimes hear, sometimes hear the word paraclete used to refer to the Holy Spirit. That's merely the English transliteration of the Greek word that John uses, which translates as something like, one who is called alongside you, or one who accompanies you. One scholar points out that in John, the word is used variously to mean guide, teacher, aid, helper, comforter, and intercessor. In this intimate context, we might conclude that the Holy Spirit is present for us in an individual fashion to get each of us through our most personal crises. And that, my friends, is absolute truth. However, the full breadth and magnitude of the Spirit's action extends well beyond our personal companion on the way. Enter the Acts of the Apostles. The great minds behind the lectionary ensure that we hear the intimate past pastoral aspect of the Holy Spirit, as revealed in John's Gospel, as a complement to the grand dramatic reading of the day. Before we look at the second actor of cha about a chapter of Acts, we should remember that this is the continuation of Luke's Gospel. That context helps us realize that dramatic as it may have been, the movement of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem that day was not a once and done thing. The spirit has been present in Luke all along. 
from John the Baptist to Mary, to Elizabeth, to Zechariah, to Simeon. Nor did the Holy Spirit cease her inspiration on the day of Pentecost. We might say that nothing happened in Jesus's ministry outside the presence of the Holy Spirit, that that very same spirit accompanied his disciples after his ascension, and the same spirit continues to inspire every aspect of our ministry today. Turning to our first lesson experience here, presenting the reading in this fashion isn't new or unique, but it does have its appeal for a drama queen like me. There are issues to be sure, but it gives us a chance to think a bit about the experience of those who were there on that day, when, as some people describe it, the church was born. Aside from seeing if y'all were paying attention, reading in various voices and tongues nudges us in the direction of what was a miraculous experience for those who witnessed it. Think about the cacophony of the third time the reading was done when all six languages were read simultaneously. That isn't meant to represent what any individual actually heard. It's more like what a fly on the wall would hear if the fly had ears. The lesson allows for some ambiguity because even as the disciples are said to have been inspired by the spirit to speak in other languages, when the crowds gathered, each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Each heard them speaking in their language. Would individuals in the crowd really have been able to discern their own language among the more than two dozen tongues the lessons say were present and spoken that day? I wonder if rather than the disciples' language changing, it was the language understood by the hearer that was the locus of the Spirit's miracle. The second time we heard the lesson, it was in six different languages, but at least it wasn't all at once. Now, some of us may understand all six of these tongues, but I certainly don't, nor do most of us. I have one person in mind who might be an exception to that. But even if we were fluent in several of them, it's probably likely that one of those languages stood out as the one that we prefer for conversation and learning. The second pass might be akin to what someone would have heard if the disciples did in fact teach in different languages. And that someone moved around through the area to hear what individual groupings of folks from just a few disciples were hearing as the disciples taught in a common language to that group. But that's not really what the text says. The first time through in one language that each of us understands might be closer to what the people experienced back then. But imagine that our readers here today were indigenous to the Amazon and had never spoken or heard a word of English. It might have been something kind of like that. The key point is this, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would be with his disciples whenever the need arose, and indeed was there with them from the very beginning of their ministry. The people gathered in Jerusalem were amazed and astonished as they heard the story of God's work in and through Jesus, bringing glory to God by enabling each to hear the gospel message in their own native tongue. The Holy Spirit demonstrated the radical inclusiveness of God. A wise commentator remarked, when the spirit falls on us, it's good, it's inclusive, it's every tongue, it's every tribe, and that is good news. Our challenge at St. James midway through 2022 is to live into that reality, 
to truly embody that inclusiveness as we shift our collective fo focus from regathering to outreach to our neighbors. As disciples of the living Christ, we get to have it both ways. As a congregation, a diocese, a national church, a communion, the global Jesus movement, we welcome the Holy Spirit to inspire, enlighten, and even challenge us, just as the earliest disciples experienced, as is recorded in Acts. As individuals, however, we may take comfort from the presence of sacred wisdom who knows us by our very name and accompanies us every step of our way, even when we fail to recognize her. Sorry.